Right, let's get to the guest on this edition. It is Bas Lansdorp, the man behind the Mars One project. It's a big pleasure, Howard. Thanks for having me. Do you know, the one question I've wanted to ask you first, Bas, and I guess it is the right place to put this question, what is it within you that made you want to do this? Uh, well, I think it's the obvious. I, I want to go to Mars. And uh, I came up with the idea of wanting to go to Mars about 20 years ago when I was still a student of mechanical engineering in Holland. And uh, I thought, well, I'm Dutch, I'm not American. Mm -hmm. And back then, the only group that was planning to go to Mars was NASA. So if I want to go to Mars, I'm going to have to do it myself. So as a naive uh, mechanical engineering student, I started reading uh, uh, old mission designs, always immediately scrapping away anything that had to do with the return mission, which I think is a big waste of uh, resources. Um, and I, uh, I, I still want to go. I won't be on one of the first missions. We can talk about that later. Mm. Uh, but I still hope to go to Mars one day. We will talk about that later. You know that this whole idea of the non-returnable mission, the idea that you go there and you stay there, is very, very controversial. There are people that I've had on this show, they've said that will not work. But you've been determined to do it that way from the start, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Mars One started about six years ago, but even 20 years ago, uh, I always assumed that it would be a permanent settlement mission for a number of reasons. First of all, I think that it would literally be a, a, an enormous waste to send uh, tourists or visitors to Mars if you actually need workers there. You need to build a settlement, uh, a, a new colony of mankind in a different place. You need people who will work and build for the rest of their lives. And you, you, you don't want to spend so much resources for people who are going to spend a couple of months or a year there. But... I actually believe that it's practically impossible from many points of view to have the first crew return. I mean, just look at how difficult it is to launch something from Earth. And thousands, of, sometimes hundreds, but sometimes thousands of engineers are checking all the systems at the last moment. Everything is go, and then 5% of all rocket launches from Earth fail. And they don't all explode, that's mm. the ones we see in the news, but 5% have the payload, the satellite, end up in the wrong orbit. Now, if that's from Earth, where we have the hundreds or thousands of engineers and we have everything under control, how can we do it from Mars, where the return rocket will have been launched from Earth with all the vibrations, will have flown through space uh, with the vacuum and the temperature differences, etc. Then it will enter the Martian atmosphere. Again, there's vibrations. Then there's a big bang when it hits the surface. Uh, we don't know exactly how big the bang will be. Then the, 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 the return vehicle is going to stand on the surface of Mars for well, at least a couple of years before the return crew is going. Then there's three or four people, and they need to prepare that, that rocket that on Earth would be considered completely, completely unusable. They, three or four people are going to make that rocket fly back to Earth. It's impossible. It's practically completely impossible. And uh, fortunately, right now, there's a lot of people who uh, do agree with us. And for example, Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon, he has pleaded in the American Congress that NASA should be working on a one-way mission to Mars instead of return. So it's, it's catching on, but it's, um, I, don't, I don't think that the, 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 the national space agencies are ever going to do something like that because they want their people back. And that's why I think that it will not be the national space agencies that will land on Mars first. So the people you're recruiting right now, Bess, to do this, those people have to realize that, you know, once they say goodbye to people here on Earth, they may have some radio communication with them, but when they get there, they are not coming back. That is the rest of their life. And presumably, if you go there, that's going to include you, will it? That sounds really dramatic, doesn't it? But it we've does, been doing very. It for, for millennia. That's how humans have conquered the planet. Continent by continent, we've moved out away from our home in Africa, and we don't commute home to have dinner in Africa every evening. And I guess if you Even think about it this way, Bas, the people who, and I'm only just starting to think about it now, having talked with you, the people who conquered the west coast of America, having conquered the east coast, that was a massive achievement. They had to build a railroad that went all the way through, blasting rock in the way. If some people died making that thing. It was a huge, huge venture they must have realized that many of them were not going back. So it's the same pioneer spirit. 
Yeah, actually, I think it's uh, it's a, it's even a little bit less of a pioneer spirit, spirit than the people who before them uh, were the native inhabitants of uh, North America, uh, and uh, so people have been doing this for fifty thousand years, not just the last uh, couple of hundred years that uh, that we consider modern history, but long before that. But even a hundred years ago, if you were migrating from England to uh, to Australia then you were buying a one-way ticket on a boat. And you could return, in theory, of course, you could return. But if you wanted to communicate to your, to your family or your friends back home, you had to send a letter. Do you remember the old-fashioned letter? Um, and it would take a couple of months for your letter to go from Australia back to London. And then your family would send a reply, and it would take another couple of months before you could read it. Now, you sound Mark, very, you can... very comfortable with this, and I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to get uh, every minute to count of this conversation, because it's taken a while to set up. You're comfortable with this, but what about those people? And I think at a news conference about a year ago, you said you'd had something like a 1,000 applications already. Maybe I'm wrong about the number. But, you know, how confident can you be that all of those people have accepted this fact? Well, we, uh, we received more than 200,000 registrations for the job vacancy of our first teams. Mm. And we're now down to about a hundred, uh, to exactly a hundred round three candidates that are still interested in going. So, of course, in the 200,000 registrations, which was just people uh, filling in their name, their email address, yes, I accept the terms and conditions uh, on the website. And so, of course, in those 200,000, there, there, I'm sure there were people that didn't think it through completely. But uh, the, the 100 uh, round three candidates and even the, the, the 1,000 round two candidates that we had, I'm 100% convinced that these are people that have, uh, that at least think th- um, that they can deal with that. Of course, that's the, the biggest challenge of Mars One is not in the technology and it's not in the funding. It's in finding a team that can actually be the first team, deal with being the first team to go to Mars and live there for two years before the second crew is joining them. And that's, that's our biggest challenge. And that's definitely something that I do not want to underestimate uh, here on the show. So you've got 100 people. Uh, you've got to thin those down. How are you going to do that? Actually, I, w- I would, would like to add one more thing about the, uh, the distance of Mars and uh, comparing it to the history of exploration. Mm. So, as I said, w- if you were migrating to Australia, uh, you could go back in theory. And, but if you wanted to communicate, there was the letter. From Mars, you can send a WhatsApp message. I mean, Curiosity rover is actually sending photos all the time. We are sending commands to the rover. And the, Mars is never more than 20 minutes away. So a return signal would take 40 minutes as compared to a couple of months if you were living in Australia. So you will actually be much more in touch with your friends from Mars than people were 100 years ago from Australia. But of course, there is no possibility. There is no point in sending a message saying, dear folks, not really enjoying it here, want to come home because you can't. <laughs> That's it. When you're there, you're there. Yeah. You've got to get on Absolutely. with everybody yeah. else. And that's why it's so important for Mars One to do the uh, the astronaut selection extremely well. So the 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 most important thing is. So of course we're selecting people that are that are very healthy because there's no hospitals on Mars yet. We need people that are very smart because you, we're going to teach them a lot of new skills, engineering skills to fix anything that breaks, medical skills, dental skills, botanical skills to grow their own food. But the most important thing that we'll do during the training is testing them. So we'll build a copy of the Mars outpost here on Earth, uh, and we'll lock up the teams that are training, and they're training for 14, 15 years. We'll lock them up under Martian conditions at least once per year, and we'll test them for their ability to deal with the situation that they will find on Mars. And this might take a couple of days, or it, they might be in the outpost for half a year or for a whole year. They won't know when they go in to make sure that they can't count down the days, mm. uh, just like on Mars. And um, we'll, they will find out and we will find out if the teams are capable of dealing with such a situation. This all assumes, of course, that human beings can survive on Mars. There are some people who say, actually, they can't. Bas Landsdorp is a dreamer. You believe they can? Well, I'm absolutely convinced that humans can't survive on Mars, just like they can't survive in London, and just like they can't survive here in uh, in, in uh, the Netherlands, without technology. 
you need technology to survive uh, uh, here in Holland. Uh, at the other side is the, of the North Sea in, 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 the, in the UK, even more so in the north of Norway, where the, when the winter is even more cold and dark. And uh, you need technology to survive in the International Space Station, and you need technology to survive on Mars. But Mars is actually a little bit easier than the International Space Station, where humans have already been alive for more than 16 years now. Why is that Mars so? Has gravity, uh, Mars has resources, so um, which both uh, both of them are not available in the, in the International Space Station. So. Um, and there, there is no doubt that humans can survive on Mars. The only question is, can, can, you, can you make everything work? Is your plan to terraform Mars, Bass? For those who don't know what that means, that event that essentially means trying to turn Mars into something in terms of a landscape you can grow stuff on and you know <laughs> have a reasonable atmosphere. That means the aim is to change it. Is that your plan? Um, no, it is not. So, uh, as you said in the beginning, uh, in the introduction, uh, a human mission to Mars is a huge, huge endeavor. It's, it's extremely complex, but I believe that something like terraforming Mars would be a thousand times, literally a thousand times more complex. So look at this Earth. We're, we're, we're trying to pollute it. I'm making quote marks in the, in the air now. We're trying to pollute it with seven billion people, with exhaust gases and all kinds of other things that we're doing to change. Uh, changing the atmosphere, but the effect still took a couple of decades to uh, to really um, to really prove. And now imagine four or eight or twenty or or a hundred people living on Mars trying to change the environment there. It's it's such a moment momentous uh, task. It's I believe that if we ever start doing that, it's going to be uh, an enormous task. And I I think it might actually be easier to find a more habitable planet uh, orbiting another star than to try to terraform Mars. But who knows, right? I mean, uh, if you were talking to someone 200 years ago and you would tell them that you can fly to New York one day and back the other, they would think you're complete, completely insane, and yet we're doing it every day. So um, for, at this moment, I would say it's, it's almost impossible, but... Uh, I, I think that I should definitely be one to not talk about impossible because I'm trying to do one other thing that many people consider impossible, going to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's hold that thought right there because I want to get into the technology, the financing and the timeline next. So, Bas, we talked about some of the issues that will face the people who will be doing this because it will be a one-way trip for those pioneers going to Mars. Let's talk about, first of all, the financing of this. I read on your website that at the moment your company has a valuation of 389 uh, million US dollars. I think that's correct. Uh, that follows a recent issue of shares. There are people who are telling me that even with that kind of money, you are not going to be able to afford to do this. Uh, that's absolutely right. We estimate the cost of our mission to be about six billion US dollars. Uh, but of course, the valuation of the company has nothing, nothing to do with uh, what we can afford when in time. So right now, we don't need hundreds of millions. We need uh, a few tens of millions to take our project from uh, basically a startup that we are right now to the next level. So what we're, what we're aiming to do in the next uh, year is hiring some, some really good uh, team members. So, for example, ex-NASA uh, people who have actually participated in, um, in, the in the organizing of Mars missions, uh, uh, unmanned, but still uh, something much more uh, relevant than the experience that we have in the team right now. Or ex-Lockheed Martin, so people who have, for NASA, built the systems that have actually landed on Mars. Uh, we need to hire uh, an excellent CEO for Mars One Ventures, the, the stock exchange listed uh, company, uh, and we need someone there who has experience in monetizing stories. So, for example, someone from Disney or from the uh, from the uh, marketing bureau of the Olympics or from the World Cup. Um, so. Excellent team members is the first thing that we need to do. So are you hoping to raise most of this money, and that's a huge amount of money, $6 billion, you were saying, uh, from the media rights? Are you hoping to make a lot of money from the media rights? Is that what you're saying to me? Um, no, the, the, business case, the business case of Mars One is, the, is monetizing the story of the human mission to Mars. So that mm -hmm. means, indeed, 
uh, the, the value of the exposure, but with that also comes um, merchandise, uh, application fees from people, people who apply to Mars, uh, ads on video content. Uh, and later on, when we're actually sending things to Mars, uh, we, we will have revenue from directly from broadcasting rights. But it's a, it's a whole range of, of sources of revenue. And don't forget that Disney uh, has a, a story that you probably know. It's called Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, they make about two billion per year from the story. And that's fiction. The, the this will be real. The Star Wars brand mm -hmm. is two billion right. US dollars per year. So you're thinking you can you can multiply that because their, their product is fiction and this is going to be the real deal. Exactly. And there's a number of uh, a number of other business cases around Mars One that we will also be able to use that uh, that they don't have. For example, technology spin-off. If we develop the systems to grow food on Mars with less water and less energy than we need here on Earth, uh, these kinds of systems will definitely have value here on Earth. Or um, business cases that become possible when humans uh, or, or private companies are actually even just sending systems to Mars. We've been approached by a, uh, by a company that provides the service uh, to um, to to people where they can send uh, a small fraction of the ashes of a beloved or of themselves after they die uh, to Earth orbit. And they approached us and they asked, can we use uh, some space on your systems to over our customer customers to land a small portion of their ashes, about a gram of their ashes on Mars? And what are you thinking so, of charging for that? How much will that be? Well, I, I, I can't really disclose that, but the, what I'm trying to say is, if we start doing something as exciting as actual exploration of Mars, then these kinds of business cases will pop up. Don't forget that Columbus, Columbus was pitching a business case to the Queen. He was pitching a shortcut to India. Now, he failed miserably. He, he has never found a shortcut to India, but he found America. And if you do something that's different and exciting and um, on the edge, then there will be there will be rewards, and sometimes you don't know in advance what that will be. Uh, in this case, we know a number of the things, but I'm sure that there will also be uh, benefits that we that we can't even think about yet, like uh, the uh, the example that I just mentioned. All right, you talked about application fees from the people who've applied to be astronauts and go with you. How much do the people who do that pay? Uh, they pay, pay a relatively small application fee of about 30 US dollars. Uh, we scaled that to the GDP per capita. So, for example, someone from Qatar, the, the richest country uh, per capita, they paid $75. And someone from Congo, which uh, was the poorest country when we, uh, when we did our application, uh, they paid $5. So we wanted it to be, to be enough to think about, but not so much that people would not be able to fund it if they really wanted to be part of our mm. program. So how much but did you make from that? Exclude. If you had 200,000 people uh, get in touch through the website initially, how much money did you make from those initial applications? I'm just interested in you know, how you're going to fund this. Uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, so the first step was to register on the website. That's what 200,000 people they did. And about uh, 10,000 people actually paid the application fee. So it was somewhere around 300,000 uh, US dollars. This was in 2013 uh, when um, when this was uh, an amount that really mattered to us. And um, I believe that if we repeat the selection process this year or next year, we don't yet know yet when the next uh, round of applications will be. Uh, of course, we'll have a lot more brand awareness. People didn't. A lot of people didn't know Mars One back in 2013. A lot more people know us now. So I wouldn't be surprised if there will be a lot more applications, so much more than the 200,000, but also a lot more people that actually finish their application and therefore also pay the application fee simply because they've seen Mars One take a few more steps than they had seen in 2013. Presumably, uh, I saw on your website you're looking for donations. The kind of donations you're looking for are not the kind of $10 that I could send you. You're looking for a big <laughs> commercial uh, or philanthropist to get in touch with you and say we're really fired up and enthused by this, we think it's got a lot of mileage literally in it. Uh, here's a couple of million dollars. That's what you want, isn't it? Uh, well, actually, I think both are important. So, 
Uh, Mar- uh, just to clarify for uh, for the people listening, Mars One is a, a, a for-profit entity, Mars One Ventures, uh, which is monetizing the mission, uh, raising the initial funds to uh, to get some of the things going. But the most important part of Mars One is actually the Mars One Foundation, uh, which is a not-for-profit foundation uh, that I- that will organize the mission and that will train the crews. Uh, well, we've been taking uh, donations for since, uh, well, uh, we didn't actually take donations when we started, but people started emailing us, can we please donate? So we quickly fixed that. And uh, we get donations from more than 100 different countries. And we see that we'll, with every step that we take, the average amount goes up and the number of people that contribute goes up. And with those small amounts, so because the, the, the smallest donation is uh, basically a dollar, you can donate whatever you like. The biggest, some of our biggest donors donate $200 per month. Um, and that, that does really add up because of the, the number of people that are donating. And, you know, it's not, it's, of course, the, it's great to have that source of revenue for the, for the Mars One Foundation, but it's also building a community of people who think that this is important. And they talk to their friends and they say, this is important, I'm supporting it. They buy a t-shirt and they, 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 they tell the story of Mars One to their friends, and that's actually really important because I think the the most the the biggest value that Mars One can bring to the world, that Mars exploration can bring to the world, is actually the story, the inspiration of of humans taking the next steps um, and going to the next frontier, the um, the inspiration that that can bring to our kids that will want to be scientists and and engineers and astronauts if they can actually see see humans going to Mars and I think also and I think the most important thing that Mars exploration will bring to the world is the realization of how special our own planet is and it, there is no plan B there is no plan B for keeping seven billion people alive we have to take care of this planet. And if we can show the world through Mars exploration that the second best place in the solar system, which is Mars, that's a dry desert planet and it can never support 7 billion people. I think that that is the, one of the most important values that's, that Mars exploration can bring. And so the whole community building that Mars One is doing, and that includes uh, uh, asking uh, donations and actually receiving them, I think that's important extremely important for the storytelling and for the value that Mars One can bring to the world. If I've got your timeline right, your first major test, financially, technically, and in every way, is in 2022, just five years from now, uh, when you plan an unmanned demonstration mission to Mars. Talk to me about that. Yes, I think that that's our most important uh, mission, because right now, as I already said when I was talking about funding, Mars One is, is really still a startup. And we need to show to the world that in five years' time we will have grown from a startup to a company that can do the same that NASA does, which is landing an unmanned uh, spacecraft onto the surface of Mars. Of course, we, the, the great thing is that we have the experience of NASA already doing it. So we'll hire uh, some of the people that have contributed to that. Uh, we will work with uh, Lockheed Martin for that. So we've already had our first, first contract with them. Uh, to investigate if the uh, the platform of the Phoenix NASA Phoenix mission, if that can be reused to uh, to send our mission to Mars in 2022. And are they happy to um, give you this technology to share it with you? Um, well, the, the the platform is um, is designed by Lockheed Martin, uh, so we will simply hire Lockheed Martin as a contractor and ask them to build a similar platform for us. Um, but it's it's uh, Lockheed Martin intellectual property. It's, it doesn't the platf- the design of the platform does not belong to NASA. Okay, how much money do you need to get to be able to buy this to be able to do it all in 2022? Uh, the NASA mission costs about 400 million uh, US dollars. Um, now we've assumed that uh, out of um, uh, uh, out of conservancy reasons, we've assumed that our the cost for us will be the same. Although I believe that by being an easier client, and NASA is a pretty tough client <laughs> with lots of checks and balances, um, and we believe that Lockheed Martin is a uh, is such a, a a great supplier that we would ask them build this mission for us. And of course, if you if you if you don't make it, if something goes wrong, then we won't pay your 
final payment, which is actually your profit. But please don't, and uh, please, they know how to do this. So mm-hmm. they should, they should uh, build and fly the mission for us and they'll get paid to do it. Okay, uh, so you we'll said like- one thing that I've just got to ask you about, though, uh, which piqued my interest, that you said that NASA was a more difficult client because they have so many checks and balances in there. Does that mean, and I'm sure it doesn't, but you tell me, that there will be some corners that you will cut? No, there won't be corners. Well, there will, there will be corners that we will cut, but there won't be corners that Lockheed Martin will cut. And they, their prestige will be on the line when they fly this mission. And I believe that... Um, when you when you ask a contractor that has the experience that has already done it successfully if you're going to ask them to to do the same again for you why not trust them and take a, a huge cut in the check that you need to pay them by by not checking every step too thoroughly then uh, i think that that's a, a risk worth taking of course you you do take a small risk but i believe that if you if you do this in the right way, of course there will, there won't be no checks, but you should be very careful with you should think very careful carefully about what you check with a group like Lockheed Martin and where you're going to trust them. All right, and that's why you're hiring people who have that kind of expertise. Uh, there then follows, if this is successful, in the following, how many years am I looking at here, the following decade or more, actually 15 years, 20 years, very nearly, um, a whole series of automated missions that will essentially build the place where the people will go. Is that so? Uh, correct. So in 2022, there's this demonstration mission that we just talked about. Besides proving Mars 1, it will also demonstrate extraction of water from the Martian surface and thin film solar panels on the surface of Mars. Two years later, we sent a communication satellite. At 2026, again two years later, we're sending a rover to Mars that will determine the right location for the outpost. Again, two years later, or 26 years later, it's 2029, we're sending all the hardware for the manned missions, but not the humans. Uh, the, The systems will be moved to the right location by the rovers, will be activated, so water, breathable air will be produced in the outpost uh, before the first crew is even uh, departing. And then in 2031, uh, in our current schedule, the first crew will be sent to low, low Earth orbit and from, w- from there will depart to Mars. Okay, so 2031, we have the first four people on the surface of Mars, if all this goes to plan. How do you build up a colony from there and, and when do you go? So 2031 is departure. Uh, it takes seven months to fly to Mars, so they will land in 2032. Uh, and then a few weeks after the first crew lands, the hardware for the second crew will land, uh, because we always send the hardware ahead of the crews. And every two years, we send additional crews and additional hardware for the crew uh, arriving two years later. Um, so when should, when will I go to Mars? It's a, it's a good question. So. Uh, six years ago, I started Mars One. A bit over six years ago, and I would have I would have given anything to fly to Mars the next day. Mm-hmm. Right now, I have two kids. Uh, the oldest one is almost four. Uh, my youngest son is uh, one and a half. And right now, I wouldn't go. So if 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 the doorbell rang now and, and NASA st- stood at my doorstep and they said, "Come on, bus, let's go," uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think this. <laughs> don't assume <laughs> that I'm good enough. Uh, but. Um, if, if this would happen, I would say no, because I wouldn't want to leave my family right now. But maybe when they're, I don't know, 14 or, or 20 or 25, uh, maybe I, I will want to take that, uh, that step again. Uh, or maybe, you know, I'm the CEO of Mars One. Maybe I can bring my family when my kids are, uh, are adults. Um, but I, w- I do still have a lot of convincing to do before my wife will join me. I'm sure you do. But if the boss can't take his family, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who else can. Uh, but the, the, is there any upper age limit, though? Because, you know, none of us is getting any younger. Uh, there has to be a point at which you won't be able to make that trip. Absolutely. Uh, especially for the first cruise, there will be not so much an upper age limit, but a lower health limit. Uh, so, for example, uh, you cannot be dependent on medicine. Uh, because uh, obviously it's it's too difficult on Mars. Um, but you know, there's there's 35 year olds that can hardly get out of their chair, and there's 70 year olds that run a couple of marathons per year. So it's difficult to say to say this is the the upper age limit. Um, but 
if, if, if people are getting more and more healthy. I, I do think that there is a lower age limit. I think it's very difficult for someone under 30 to really make the decision for the rest of their life to go to Mars and not return. I'm sure there will be a few, uh, a, a very small percentage of the people who apply, who, who, who are so dedicated and so motivated that they could make that choice when they're 26, 28. But I think m most people need more time before they can make a decision that's so profound. So uh, I think there's a more clear lower age limit than there is an upper age limit. Do you consider yourself to be in a race with NASA? Because they're doing this already. Um, well, I've explained to you why I believe that the, the return mission is just too difficult to achieve. And we, a lot of people ask, but hey, the, the moon, uh, the, NASA did the moon. Why, why wouldn't they be able to do Mars? They returned from the moon. But there's two major differences. There's the, the scale. Uh, the, the, moon, the moon is only three days away. You fly your people there on the system. They fly back on the same system so that you don't have a system that's standing there for a long uh, period of time. But I think even more importantly, there's the change in, uh, in, in the willingness to take risks. The moon landings were a huge risk, but NASA was willing to take that risk. And right now there's huge, huge risk averseness in the space agency. So I've explained to you... Um, when I was explaining how difficult it is to, uh, to send things from Earth, so let alone from Mars, I've explained to you what such a mission might look like, but I actually believe that NASA would want to do a full test of the, of the entire system with an, with, an unmanned, uh, with an unmanned rocket departing from Mars and showing that it can return a cargo to Earth safely. But how are you going to do all the steps that we've talked about? So. Uh, preparing the rocket for launch if there's no humans on the surface. I, I'm convinced that NASA wouldn't launch an untested rocket from Mars like they did with the moon. And, uh, the, the, uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed in a system that had never been on the moon and they launched in a system that had ne never taken off from the moon. I think for Mars, uh, with the current risk averseness of the space agencies, that's uh, impossible. And that makes it even more dis difficult to do the return mission. So I think that in 20 years, uh, the space agencies will still be going to Mars in 20 years, just like uh, in uh, 1996, we were going to Mars in 2016. And in 1969, we were going to Mars in 1989. Uh, just to finish up some loose ends here with Bas Lansdorp, uh, the boss of Mars One, what an exciting project this is. It is going to be a money spinner. Now, Bas, you're talking about $6 billion that you need at today's prices. Uh, inflation is becoming an issue here in the UK. I'm sure it is in Holland as well. Uh, we've had zero inflation for a long time. Now it's coming back. Uh, chances are within 20 years you're going to need $10 billion. But you sound very confident that whatever it takes, the money will come. Well, of course, if, uh, if there's inflation, then all the revenues will also uh, be inflated by the same amount. So uh, I actually think I would, I would welcome inflation because uh, it, in our business case, our revenues are larger than our expenses. So it would actually be good for our business case if there's a little bit of inflation. Right. OK, <laughs> I never thought of it that way. I guess you have to think about these things all the time. Your company, your business, as you've said already, has got to have two very large and very distinct segments. Number one, there is the marketing side, because that's going to generate the, the money. You've got to get that traffic coming in, otherwise the money's not going to be there. Number two, there will be an enormous technical effort that you'll have to put in. Keeping those things going is, uh, you know, more than a task for one man, I would think. Do you, do you, presumably you have people you delegate important things to, even now? Uh, absolutely, we're about 10 people in Mars One, but I uh, I really have to stress how important it is that we find additional team members in the next couple of years. So we need people with actual experience in organizing uh, the unmanned missions to Mars that uh, NASA has been performing, with building the systems uh, that uh, private space agencies have built for NASA. For so, for example, people from Lockheed Martin. Uh, and don't forget that Mars One is not going to build the systems. We're going to uh, purchase the systems from suppliers like Lockheed Martin and other aerospace companies. 
It's actually our goal to not build a single component of the Mars mission in Mars 1. Because if you wanted to do that, then our timeline would be much too ambitious. You can't develop the systems in the time that we are uh, planning to do our mission. You have a competitor in NASA, but their mission plan and their mission statement is very different from yours, as we've already discussed. You are not the only one, though, privately looking to do this. Uh, what do you know of your competitors? Do you have contact with them? Well, as far as we know, there's there's not really uh, a competition. So a lot of people think that SpaceX is a competitor mm. of Mars One, but SpaceX is a transportation company. And uh, Elon Musk gave a really interesting presentation in Mexico uh, last summer, where he explained his uh, his ambitious plans of uh, the, the the Mars uh, transportation system. But he made it very clear that they are. Uh, a transportation company so he compared it to the railroads in the u.s he said we are building the rails we are building the trains but we need private entities or uh, government entities to purchase our systems uh, for their goals um so uh, that's really a, su a supplier and um as far as we know there's not really any competition but of course there could be i mean anyone who has uh, six billion or more in their bank account, and that sounds really scary, but that's more than 250 people on the planet. In principle, they could do it if they wanted to, and they could, especially in the in the next couple of years, two three years, they could beat us uh, because they have the money in the bank already. Well, there is nothing but, to stop and, any of those other space players, and that includes, I guess, the likes of Virgin. Elon Musk has got deep pockets. He's He's got uh, arguably money that you don't have. There is nothing to stop any of those people coming in and saying, actually, we want to do it. Yes, that's absolutely right, except at some point in time, uh, they will they will not have the, uh, the, the possibility to catch up because you need to take a number of steps. I'm absolutely convinced that the, the hardware, the, 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 um, the outpost needs to go to Mars before the humans go. Before you send the outpost, you have to send a rover as a beacon for your, uh, for your cargo missions, but also to make sure that you're landing in, the, in a location where there's enough water in the soil and where it's nice and flat for construction. Before that, I'm convinced you need to do one more mission to test your uh, your uh, your landing system. So there there are simply a number of steps that you that you have to take before you can send humans. So it's at some point in time it will be difficult to overtake uh, Mars One. When you have established the colony on Mars, so after 2031 you have the first four astronauts there, then you'll send progressively more people there. What will that colony be doing? Will it be producing uh, perhaps materials that can be sent back to Earth? Will it be doing something useful for us here? I think that uh, the, 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 what the use of a colony on Mars is not on Mars, it's directly on Earth. I think the, the, the inspiration that it will bring is extremely important. I think the, the, the realization of how, sp how special our planet is is extremely important. And I think that for a very long time, until uh, transportation from Mars to Earth becomes uh, affordable, uh, until that time, I think the most important export product uh, or products will be, uh, first of all, the story. So the monetization of the story of humans exploring Mars and uh, uh, intellectual property. So... We know that humans make the greatest inventions when they're under pressure. Uh, that happens during war and during exploration. Well, I, I'm a, uh, not a big fan of war and a huge fan of exploration. So uh, I, I'm convinced that when you have people on Mars and th their life will be tough, uh, I'm convinced that they will come up with extremely intelligent solutions for all kinds of problems, some of which we don't even know we have on Earth. But they, there will be systems... And some of them will be completely useless for Earth because they're very Mars-specific, but some of them will be great solutions that we can also use here on Earth. So uh, I think for a very long time, those two, the story and intellectual property, will be the only export products uh, from Mars back to Earth. When you have people there, is it your plan that those people will reproduce on Mars? Will they have babies? And that's actually the second most frequently asked question <laughs> to our mailbox. Mars baby. So the first one is, can I go? 
Mm-hmm. The second one is, uh, will there be children on Mars? Well, first of all, we don't know if, uh, if um, babies that are uh, conceived in lower gravity and that are growing in the womb in lower gravity, uh, we don't know exactly what, uh, how, they will, how they will come out. So um, this needs to be investigated. And how, how can you investigate that? If there is a possibility, and there will be a possibility of mutation, which is not a good thing, um, I would guess. How do you investigate that? Well, I think that you need to do on Mars uh, animal tests to make sure that that works on animals before, you, before any human should uh, try it. But I think actually even more importantly... When, when there's four people or eight people on Mars, it's really an outpost. It's not a village, it's an outpost. And you don't want a toddler running around there. I mean, it's, it's an extremely dangerous environment. Anything could go wrong at any moment. And with the, with the uh, very low air pressure outside uh, and, and all kinds of other risks, it's simply too risky uh, to, to even think about having children. Mm. Um, so it needs to be investigated with animal tests and uh, the the outpost needs to become a village and then maybe uh, they can start thinking about uh, creating some actual martians and even above and beyond all of these enormous technical challenges there are massive psychological ones to deal with the first one of course we've talked about the idea that you're going there you're not coming back how will you stop people prevent people becoming bored on the surface of Mars because, you know, for a long time there'll be nothing to look at apart from the red terrain. There'll be a lot of work to do, that's for sure. But, you know, we have a saying here, I'm sure you have it there, that all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Uh, You know, there have got to be other parts of your life. Absolutely, but don't forget that uh, they can do anything that we can do on Earth indoors. So how much time do people actually spend outside? Some people, a lot, but a lot of people, they walk to their car, Hmm. they drive to the office, in the evening they walk to their car uh, and back home and from their car to to their actual actual door, and that's all the time they spend outside. But all these things that they do inside of the house, so watching a football game on the television, playing a game, uh, chatting with your friends online, all these things they can also do on Mars. So I think the difference will actually be a lot smaller for many people than you might assume. Of course, if you're the type that uh, every weekend you go uh, into the outdoors, you, that, that uh, goes sailing, that goes to the beach, and those kinds of people that, that value that a lot in their life, they shouldn't go to Mars. Uh, but for, for many people, the outdoors is really not that important. And indoor, there's, there's, a, there's plenty that you can do on Mars. One of my listeners asked me to ask you this question, and I will because I think it's a fascinating question, and you must have thought of this. Have you worked out a protocol? Will you be working out a protocol, Bass, for the possibility, and it now seems more of a possibility than it might have seemed 10 years ago, the possibility that either on the way to Mars or while you're there, you discover one of two things, aliens or proof that there's been a previous civilization, perhaps us, living on Mars. Uh, in that situation, have you worked out what you will do, how you will, you know, who you will tell, if you will tell anybody, and how you will do that? Well, I think if, if something like that uh, would pop up, I think that would be the, the most exciting event in the history of mankind. If, if we know that we're not alone, uh, either, even if that means that uh, as space that our life has been transported from Mars to Earth or from from Earth to Mars, Uh, or if it's independent life, I mean, both of those scenarios would change our uh, idea about life in the universe completely, because right now, of course, we have only one proof of life in the universe, which is us, uh, all the life on this planet. But if on the neighboring planet there is also life, then we have to assume that life is everywhere in the universe even if it's the same life being transported through the, through the solar system and therefore also through the universe. So, of course, this is something that we will, that we will share immediately on all, the, on all the channels, because I think that these kinds of discoveries are exactly the reason why humans are exploring, why humans are, uh, need to go to Mars. We need to understand our own history better. We want to do that. And... And making such uh, discoveries 
is what makes wor- life worthwhile. Now, I agree with you about that, and I think it's very important, but then I would say that, wouldn't I, uh, being a journalist, that uh, the information should get out there as soon as you know it. But I'm sure that governments, the American government, the Russians, us, all of us here in Europe, may have a different view of how that information should be divulged to the public. You know, there have been very clear thoughts on how we should do that. You can't just blurt it out to people. It's got to be released in a particular way. You are saying that if your team made a discovery there, you would let people know immediately. You wouldn't go through a third party. You wouldn't ask uh, Washington if that was okay. You would just do it. Well, don't forget that if I'm co- I'm 100% convinced that if we find uh, uh, life, and whether that's still alive or uh, the uh, proof of uh, of historic life on Mars, I'm convinced that it will be microbial life. Uh, I think that if uh, if what you're talking about is uh, finding uh, alien alien intelligent life, uh, that's a different story. I think if you uh, because if you find alien intelligent life, then they're most likely a lot smarter than we are because they're coming from somewhere uh, where we don't have the capability of traveling yet. Um, and that's a different story. But if there is microbial, if there's proof of microbial life on Mars, then I'm convinced that uh, that this is not something that will uh, that will cause um, uh, panic on the world. I think it will be an exciting scientific discovery uh, that a lot of people will uh, it will have big philosophical impact. But uh, it's it's not a threat to our existence. And what happens if your team find, and some people are saying that the evidence is there now, that uh, things that look less than random on the surface of Mars are in fact proof that there's been a civilization, maybe our civilization on that planet before. If you find evidence of that, equally, what would you do? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, at all um, of the opinion that we have found such, uh, such proof. Uh, there have been there have been pictures, but it's all. Uh, if you look at Earth, there's so many things that that look very interesting that are actually random, and it just sometimes it happens. Sometimes it does look like a face. Mm. Sometimes it does look like a. And, uh, don't forget that the canals on Mars that we uh, discovered, quote unquote, in the 1900s, they they turned out not to be canals. So uh, I'm I'm convinced that there there has not been. Uh, uh, a civilization on Mars, an intelligent civilization on Mars, uh, and other other people are, um, of course, entitled to their uh, to their opinions about that. But I'm uh, absolutely not convinced. And Bus, when we've conquered Mars, uh, which is you know, it's a possibility that we may be in that situation by 2050, 2060. We may have the place completely sussed out. Where else should we be looking, if anywhere? Um. Well, I think it's a it's a very difficult question. Um, if you look, if you go back a hundred years in the past, and you would tell people that it might be possible to go to the moon, they would probably think you're crazy. And now we're talking about going to Mars, but what's next? Huh? There's a number of possibilities. There's some moons that were that where we might go to. Some people are talking about a floating civilization in the atmosphere of Venus. Uh, there's the moon. Um, there's there's many there's many possibilities and it's very difficult to predict where mankind will go next. But I'm convinced that Mars is the first destination because of its resources and there's water, there's carbon for your carbon cycle, there's nitrogen for the inner part of the atmosphere. Uh, there's a, there's an atmosphere that protects you against micrometeoroids and radiation. So I'm convinced that Mars is the the next place to go. But Maybe after that we determine that it's time to build a starship and to travel to uh, an exoplanet. Then maybe in 10 years we'll, we will have found an exoplanet and we will have measured an exoplanet with, a, uh, with an atmosphere that looks a lot like the Earth's atmosphere. So it's, it's, if something like that would occur, then I think the, the, uh, the appeal of going to a moon of Jupiter becomes a lot less because there's this, there's this second Earth uh, a couple of light years away. Going to Mars, I think, is the first step of mankind's uh, journey into the, well, first the solar system and then the galaxy. And uh, who knows where we're going next? The only thing that I'm 100% convinced of is that Earth is not our final destination and neither is Mars. 
I want it all to work for you. I really do, because I've been interested in these things since I was a kid, and so have you, Bean Bus. Um, but I've got to put this to you, just finally. The first uh, big hurdle for you, apart from the crew selection and all the rest of it, which is going to be years of work that you've got right now, 2022, this unmanned demonstration mission. If, and we know that, you know, there is a failure rate uh, in space missions, even the beautifully engineered shuttle occasionally had disasters. If that first mission were to fail, would that uh, blow the bottom out of your entire project? What would you do? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, the, the, the current NASA landed missions have a success rate of almost 90%. Uh, so that that's pretty good. Now we we would be if we fly our first unmanned mission, and it will be a reflight of the NASA Phoenix mission. It would be the first mission that has a track record. So the first time that a, sick, a system is going to Mars for the second time. So we should assume that we have uh, a higher success rate than that. But there will always be a few percent um, chance that something could go wrong. And it will depend completely on where we stand at that point in time. If we, if we can afford a reflight of that mission, then I think that Mars One has a good chance of uh, surviving. If we can't, then I think it will be very difficult for Mars One to raise the funds to refly that mission. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, so that's that's exactly why we're we're uh, making the chance of mission success for for especially that mission as high as possible by reusing a system using the same supplier that NASA used uh, really everything to keep the risk of that mission as low as possible. So I think as uh, the parcel company UPS used to say in their ads in the eighties, when it absolutely positively has to be there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mission that absolutely positively has to get there. And I wish you very well with it, uh, Bass Landstop. I hope it all works out. I hope we talk again about this uh, along the way. One very last question, and thank you for all of this time tonight. If I was listening to this now, fired up with enthusiasm by what you've been saying, and if I wanted to donate but wasn't quite sure whether I should, what would you say to me to make me donate? <laughs> I would say... Anything helps. And Mars One is is really um, a community program that is made possible by people from all over the world. So um, if you want, donate $2 per month, less than the cost of a beer, and make our mission one step closer to reality. And then, you know, don't just donate the money, but follow us. Keep Keep up to date of what we're doing. Tell your friends, make sure that more and more people get excited about Mars One. Because um, I think it was Dire Straits that saying if, um, if, if you dream, if enough people dream the same dream, then it will come true. And I think Mars One is a, a good case of that. Bas Lansdorp, the head of Mars One, and thank you for giving me the time. Thank you, Howard. Was a Six billion dollars is an awful lot of money. But Bas Lansdorp is confident he will get it, and he is going to Mars.